Welcome. In this session, we are going to talk about the anatomy of the eyelids. And before discussing the structure of the eyelids, it's important to understand the functions of the eyelid. The eyelids, of course, protects the eye. It secretes the tear film components, and the tear film is important for a crystal clear vision, as well as providing protection to the ocular surface against infectious agents. The eyelid also redistributes tear film over the entire ocular surface with each blink. The eyelid also participates in the lacrimal pump which drains tears into the nose. The eyelid consists of seven layers anteroposteriorly. We have the skin and the subcutaneous tissue. The orbicular is oculi muscle, the muscle of protraction which closes the eyelid. The orbital septum, orbital fat, the retractor muscles of which there are four, two in the upper lid and two in the lower lid, the tarsus with the meibomian glands and the conjunctiva. At the preceptal level peripheral to the upper and lower tarsi, tissue layers are loosely bound and at the pretarsal level anterior to the upper and lower tarsi, the tissue layers are compact. The skin of the eyelid is the thinnest in the entire body and it does not have subcutaneous fat and there are creases and folds in the skin. The upper eyelid crease is formed by the attachment of the levator palpebris superioris aponeurosis extensions to the skin and the pretarsal orbicularis muscle and the upper eyelid fold lies above the upper eyelid crease and is formed by loose skin and subcutaneous tissue above the line of fusion of the orbital septum and the LPSA. This junction of orbital septum and LPSA is a very important surgical landmark. There is racial variation of the position of the upper lid crease with the upper lid crease being located more inferiorly in Asian eyes. In Caucasian eyes, the orbital septum LPS fusion line lies above the superior border of the tarsus and the LPS and the skin fusion line lies at the level of the superior border of the tarsus. Whereas in Asian eyes, the orbital septum LPSA fusion line lies below the level of the superior border of the tarsus and so does the LPS skin fusion line. So in Asian eyes, the upper eyelid crease is situated more inferiorly with a more prominent upper eyelid fold located above it. Similarly, there is a lower eyelid crease created by the addition to the skin of the capsulopalpebral fascia which is the analog of the levator aponeurosis in the lower eyelid but the lower eyelid crease is less well defined. Before going into the more posterior layers of the eyelid, we have to discuss two important structures to understand them, the medial canthal tendon and the lateral canthal tendon. The medial canthal tendon or the medial palpebral ligament attaches the upper and the lower eyelids to the medial orbital wall and thus maintains the position of the eyelids and the palpebral aperture. From lateral to medial, the medial canthal tendon consists of the superior and the inferior crura attaching to the tarsi of the upper and lower lids, a common portion and three arms medially, the anterior, the posterior and the superior. The anterior arm attaches to the anterior lacrimal crest anterior to the lacrimal sac. The lacrimal sac lies between the anterior lacrimal crest and the posterior lacrimal crest. So the anterior arm maintains the medial canthal angle. The posterior arm of the medial canthal tendon attaches to the posterior lacrimal crest posterior to the lacrimal sac and passes posteriorly between the two canaliculi draining into the lacrimal sac. The posterior arm of MCT is said to be less strong but is more important in opposing the eyelids to the globe. And this apposition of the eyelids to the globe maintains the positioning of the puncta in the tear film lake. The disorders of the MCT or the posterior arm of the MCT are an important cause of epiphora. The superior arm is less well defined and arises from the anterior and the posterior arms and attaches to the orbital process of the frontal bone above the lacrimal sac. The lateral canthal tendon or the lateral palpebral ligament is attached laterally to the lateral orbital tubercle and the lateral orbital tubercle is located 2 to 5 millimeters behind the lateral orbital rim. And this lateral orbital tubercle or the attachment of the lateral canthal tendon is usually 2 mm higher than the attachment of the medial canthal tendon to the medial orbital wall. 
giving the palpebral aperture a slight natural upward tilt laterally. Medially, the lateral canthal tendon divides into two crura attached to the two tarsal plates. And horizontal lengthening of the lateral canthal tendon is the most common cause of horizontal lid laxity. Now coming to the next layer of the eyelid after the skin and subcutaneous tissue, the orbicularis oculi constitutes the muscles of protraction of the eyelids and narrows the palpebral aperture upon contraction thus closing the eyes. It also functions in the lacrimal pump as we will be discussing in the next session on anatomy of the lacrimal system. The orbicularis oculi is supplied by the seventh cranial nerve, usually its zygomatic branch and it consists of three portions, the involuntary pretarsal and preceptal portions making up the palpebral portion of the orbicularis oculi and the voluntary orbital portion. The pretarsal portions lie anterior to the upper and lower tarsi, the preceptal portions lie peripheral to the upper and lower tarsi and the orbital portion lies along the upper and the lower orbital rims. The pretarsal orbicularis arises from the anterior and the posterior arms of the medial canthal tendon and the posterior portion of the two pretarsal orbicularis, one in the upper lid and one in the lower lid, may condense to form a muscle called the Horner's muscle. Laterally, the pretarsal orbicularis of the upper and the lower eyelids fuse at the lateral canthal tendon. The preceptal orbicularis arises from the upper and lower aspects of the common portion of the medial canthal tendon and the preceptal of the upper lid also has a posterior head arising from the posterior and superior arms of the NCT which has not been shown in this diagram. Laterally, the preceptal orbicularis of the upper and the lower eyelids fuse to form the lateral canthal raphe. The orbital portion of the orbicularis overlies the bony orbital rim as we have mentioned and it originates as well as inserts in the anterior arm of the medial canthal tendon. Laterally, it is continuous all around without insertion in either the lateral canthal tendon or the lateral orbital rim. Then we have the muscle of Ryolan which is also a portion of the orbicularis oculi and being associated with the eyelid margin. We are going to discuss it when we discuss the anatomy of the eyelid margin subsequently in this session. The orbital septum is very important surgically and it is a thin sheet of fibrous tissue attached to the periosteum of the superior and inferior orbital rims. In the upper eyelid, it fuses with the LPS aponeurosis 2-5 to mm above the superior border of the tarsus in Caucasian eyes. So we find the fusion of the orbital septum and the levator palpebris superioris aponeurosis 2 to 5 mm above the superior border of the tarsus. And this fusion occurs below the level of the superior border of the tarsus in Asian eyes as we have mentioned previously. In the lower eyelid, the orbital septum arises from the periosteum of the inferior orbital margin and fuses with the capsulopalpebral fascia 3 to 5 mm below the inferior tarsal edge and then it inserts into the inferior tarsal edge. Behind the orbital septum, we have the pre fat pads which are extensions of extraconal orbital fat. In the upper eyelid as well as in the lower eyelid, they are located posterior to the orbital septum and in front of the LPSA and its analog in the lower eyelid, the capsulopalpebral fascia. And in the upper eyelid, there are two a medial and a central fat pad and in the lower eyelid there are three, a medial, central and a lateral fat pad. The inferior oblique muscle which originates anteriorly in the floor of the orbit lies between the medial and central fat pads. The fat pads consist of loculi surrounded by thin capsules continuous with the orbitoseptal system. Next we come to the retractor muscles and we have two in the upper lid, the levator palpebris superioris muscle and its aponeurosis and the superior tarsal smooth muscle also called the Muller's muscle and another two in the lower lid, the capsulopalpebral fascia analogous to the levator palpebris superioris aponeurosis and inferior tarsal muscle analogous to the superior tarsal smooth muscle. The levator palpebris superioris muscle and its aponeurosis arises from the periosteum of the lesser wing of the sphenoid at the orbital apex above the annulus of zin. This we have seen in the previous session 
while discussing the anatomy of the orbit and then it runs forward in the superior orbit above the superior rectus and the length of this portion of LPS is 40 millimeters. Anteriorly it transforms into an aponeurosis and the length of the LPSA or the levator palpebris superioris aponeurosis is 14 mm to 20 mm. The LPSA divides into an anterior portion and a posterior portion. The anterior portion attaches to the septae in the subcutaneous tissue and in the orbicularis forming the upper eyelid crease and this interdigitation of the slips of the LPS aponeurosis with the skin and orbicularis maintains the close apposition of the tissues in front of the tarsus. The posterior portion of the tarsus attaches to the anterior surface of the upper tarsus. It does not attach to the superior border of the upper tarsus. It adheres strongly 3 mm above the eyelid margin and adheres loosely to the superior 3 mm of the tarsus. In the inferior aspect, the LPS has the medial and the lateral horns. The lateral horn attaches to the lateral orbital tubercle and divides the lacrimal gland into orbital and palpebral lobes. The medial horn of the LPSA attaches to the posterior lacrimal crest. The LPS is supplied by the superior division of the third cranial nerve which also supplies the superior rectus muscle. Whitnall's ligament is also called the superior transverse orbital ligament and is a part of the orbital septal system which we have discussed to a certain extent in the previous session. So the Whitnall's ligament is a linear horizontal condensation of fascia at the junction of the LPS muscle and the LPS aponeurosis and lies 12 to 14 mm above the superior border of the upper tarsus and the Whitnall's ligament provides suspensory support to the upper eyelid and redirects the anteroposterior force of the LPS muscle to the inferosuperior force of the LPS aponeurosis. Medially, the Whitnall's ligament attaches to the medial orbital wall near the trochlea and laterally it attaches to the lateral orbital wall above the lateral orbital tubercle. So the primary lateral attachment of the Whitnall's ligament is not the lateral orbital tubercle. After the primary attachment above the lateral orbital tubercle, a few fibers of LPSA do pass to the lateral orbital tubercle. The Lockwood ligament which we will be soon discussing is its analog in the lower lid. So the upper eyelid has two separate attachments in the medial orbital wall and two separate attachments in the lateral orbital wall. While as we will soon see, the lower eyelid has only one attachment in the medial orbital wall through the medial canthal tendon and the lateral orbital wall through the lateral canthal tendon. The superior tarsal muscle or the Muller's muscle it originates from the inferior aspect of the LPS muscle just anterior to the Whitnall's ligament and it inserts into the superior border of the tarsus and is strongly adherent to the conjunctiva above the tarsus. The peripheral palpebral vascular arcade lies in the plane between the LPSA and the Muller's muscle and this is an important landmark to identify the Muller's muscle. The superior tarsal muscle is a smooth muscle supplied by the sympathetic system and we have the capsulopalpebral fascia in the lower eyelid analogous to the LPSA in the upper eyelid. The capsulopalpebral fascia originates as the capsulopalpebral head from the terminal fibers of the inferior rectus muscle. The capsulopalpebral head divides and encircles the inferior oblique muscle. Anterior to the inferior oblique muscle, the two portions of the capsulopalpebral head fuse to form the Lockwood's ligament and this Lockwood's ligament is analogous to the Whitnall's ligament of the upper eyelid. The capsulopalpebral fascia then extends anteriorly from the Lockwood's ligament and inserts into the skin of the lower eyelid forming the lower lid crease, the orbital septum, the lower border of the inferior tarsus and the inferior conjunctival formix. So whereas the LPS aponeurosis attaches to the anterior surface of the superior tarsus, its analog in the lower lid, the capsulopalpebral fascia, attaches to the lower border of the inferior tarsus. The Lockwood's ligament forms a supporting hammock beneath the globe. Medially it is attached to the medial canthal tendon and laterally it is attached to the lateral canthal tendon and the lateral orbital tubercle. The inferior tarsal muscle is the other muscle of retraction in the lower eyelid but it is not well defined 
and it is analogous to the Muller's muscle of upper eyelid and it lies posterior to the capsulopalpebral fascia near the inferior conjunctival fornix. Coming to the tarsus, it is a dense fibrous connective tissue plate providing structural integrity to the eyelid. So we have a superior tarsus in the upper eyelid and an inferior tarsus in the lower eyelid. The horizontal length of each tarsi is 25 mm but the vertical height centrally is 10 to 12 mm in the upper tarsus and 3 to 4 mm in the lower tarsus. So the upper tarsus is wider than the lower tarsus and medially and laterally the tarsal plates taper off into the medial and lateral canthal tendons as we have described earlier and the tarsal plates contain the meibomian glands which secrete the lipid layer of the tear film. The tarsal conjunctiva is strongly adherent to the tarsus and consists of an epithelium and a sub-epithelial tissue. The epithelium is non-keratinized stratified squamous and contain goblet cells which secrete mucin of the tear film and the sub-epithelial tissue contains accessory lacrimal glands of cross near the inferior conjunctival fornix and wolf ring near the superior border of the upper tarsus and the inferior border of the lower tarsus. The sub and retroorbicularis fat pads lie anterior to the orbital margin and the sub orbicularis fat pad lies between the orbicularis and the periosteum of the maxillary and zygomatic bones peripheral to the lower eyelid and retroorbicularis fat pad lies deep to the eyebrow between the orbicularis and the periosteum of the frontal bone peripheral to the upper eyelid. The retroorbicularis fat pad becomes continuous inferiorly with the orbital septum arising from the periosteum of the orbital margin and should not be confused with preaponeurotic fat pads which are yellow in contrast to the white retroorbicularis fat pad and lie posterior to the orbital septum and anterior to the LPS aponeurosis. Descent of SOF and ROF results in age related aesthetic changes and can be repositioned in corrective aesthetic surgery. The eyelid margins are 30 mm long horizontally with an interpalpebral distance of 10 mm vertically when the eyelids are open in a relaxed state. In the primary position, the upper lid margin lies 1.5 to 2 mm below the superior limbus, a very important relation to remember, and lower lid margin lies at the level of the lower limbus. From anterior to posterior, the eyelid margins are made up of the skin with eyelashes. Then we have the grey line which locates the position of the muscle of Ryolan which is a condensation of the orbicularis oculi centrally. Posterior to the grey line we have the openings of the meibomian glands, the meibomian glands being located within the tarsus and we have 30 meibomian gland openings in the upper eyelid and 20 meibomian gland openings in the lower eyelid and posterior to the openings of the meibomian gland we have the mucocutaneous junction where the palpable conjunctiva terminates and meets the skin. The upper eyelid is supplied by the first or the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve and the lower eyelid is predominantly supplied by the second division or the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve. But there is a contribution from the first division of the trigeminal nerve to the lower eyelid also. So the upper eyelid is supplied by the supraorbital and the supratrochlear branches of the frontal nerve, the lacrimal nerve and the infratrochlear branch of the nasociliary nerve which supplies the medial part of the upper eyelid. The lower eyelid is supplied by the infraorbital branch of the maxillary nerve and the zygomaticofacial branch of the zygomatic nerve which supplies the lateral part of the lower eyelid and the infratrochlear branch of the nasociliary nerve also supplies the lower lid but its extreme medial part. Arterial supply of the lids is contributed by the internal carotid artery through the lacrimal and supraorbital branches of the ophthalmic artery and the external carotid artery through its angular and temporal branches and these branches and their subdivisions have extensive anastomosis and the arterial system form arcades two in the upper lid and one in the lower lid. The marginal arcade of the upper eyelid is located anterior to the tarsus 2 mm above the lid margin and the peripheral arcade 
lies along the superior tarsal border between the LPS and the Muller's muscle which we have already described and the lower lid usually has a single peripheral arcade along the lower margin of the inferior tarsus. The venous drainage of the eyelids is described as preceptal draining into the angular and superficial temporal veins and postseptal draining into the orbital veins as well as the pterygoid and anterior facial veins. Coming to the lymphatic drainage of the eyelids and classically it is described that the two-thirds of the lateral portion of the upper eyelid and one-third of the lateral portion of the lower eyelid is supplied by the pre-auricular nodes and two-thirds of the medial portion of the lower eyelid and one-third of the medial portion of the upper eyelid is supplied by the submandibular nodes. Thank you for listening.